the Empowering Teaching Excellence Podcast, powered by Academic and Instructional Services at Utah State University. This is the space where we dive into relevant topics in teaching and learning with college instructors, graduate students, and professional staff. Episode 6, A New Normal in Inclusive and Usable Online Learning. All right, welcome to this session of our ET podcast. My name is Sam Clem, and I'm going to be hosting today. Today we are here with uh, Dr. Jared Colton and Christopher Phillips to talk about their chapter in Resilient Pedagogy, A New Normal and Inclusive, Usable Online Learning Experiences. So welcome, both of you. Glad Good to, to have be you with here. you today. Thank you. Great. Um, and so we were all together last week as you gave your presentation for our seminar. So we've got a, kind of some background information already about your chapter, about kind of the main points. So today we're just going to dig a little deeper into the kind of how you got, how you got there and maybe some potential, what, what are the other things we might be thinking about after we read your chapter and want to start implementing some of this inclusive design that you all refer to in your chapter. Um, so to start off, I'm wondering what kind of hesitations do you encounter with folks? Uh, what are people resisting here when you're talking to them about inclusive design? Are you talking to them about starting to do more accessible um, practices, teaching practices in their classrooms? Thank you, Sam. Jared, I wonder if you might be willing to share a little bit some of your own hesitations as you started doing some of this work a little bit. Oh, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, and I can, we can definitely talk about other challenges because we've, we've definitely run into people who have, might have agreed with what we're doing, but then not necessarily wanted to keep, participate or something like that. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I felt, uh, originally, I felt very ethically motivated. I felt like uh, an imperative to change how I teach, to change what I teach about, to have more of my students do more accessibility work. But I know, and I kind of mentioned this in the talk, um, that when I first started doing it, uh, I was worried that I was, uh, you know, faking it until I made it kind of thing. I was a fraud. I wasn't actually an expert in this, even though I was doing a lot of reading and I was doing a lot of uh, uh, research on disability studies and accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that I was also a little worried that somebody who might be a pro, like Christopher, mm -hmm. in my opinion, would come in and tell me all the things I was doing wrong, which is a good thing <laughs> to be like how you can improve, uh -huh. but is also a, um, as a professor, you already, most professors already feel overburdened. Sure. And to, so then to be told what you're doing is wrong, you need to change your practices or you need to change uh, something or add on something to what you're doing mm -hmm. can sound overwhelming to a lot of people. They already feel like, I'm supposed to do all this research, I'm doing my teaching and all these grading, I have service elements. I'm already, uh, a lot of my work goes past your normal eight to five kind of thing and I'm doing things you know, in the mm -hmm. evening or on the weekends potentially. Um, and so they hear something about that, that you should change your practice or that you should do something new and it can feel overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And um, so I feel like that's a, hesitance that we probably, we, we definitely see from other people that I felt as well. Even though I was already kind of making the change slowly, I was worried I would have a, someone like Christopher come in and say, oh, you need to do even more, or you need to do it differently, or you need to change all these things. Which, um, especially if you're doing something that you feel uh, might be additional work, having then that maybe be criticized might be particularly vulnerable, right? Like, oh, I'm already making this effort, right? That kind of sounds like a combination there those two totally in fact we talked about this the term vulnerability a lot we have another article where we actually specifically talk about then a kind of an a, a encompassing vulnerability like you need to be okay doing it wrong making uh -huh. mistakes on it because for a lot of people it's going to be new and hopefully don't take it too personally when someone's like so you know that thing you were doing I bet I could tweak it and make it a little better for you. Right. <laughs> what do you exactly. think, Christopher? Yeah, I mean, as Jared mentioned, I think there's a couple of groups. That there may be one group of, of instructors, and this is a, a, a minority, I think, that just don't want you to touch their stuff. Just kind of leave me alone. I've been doing <laughs> what I've been doing for a long time. Just let me keep doing it. I'm not getting a lot of complaints. Fortunately, I think most people are, are very interested in, in making their content more inclusive, uh, more accessible to everybody. 
the desire is there to do it, but, but, but even when you have that desire or, or you might feel like, yes, being inclusive is part of, of my value system as a teacher or my practice, the actual, um, again, as Jared mentioned, the know-how of how to do that or taking the time out to do it is going to be a challenge a lot of the time. Um, instructors are, are busy. I mean, we're, we're all busy and not, nobody's looking for extra things to do. <laughs> and so kind of figuring out how you can adopt some of these principles just into your everyday practice without it being a big extra thing is important. And it also kind of speaks to, I mean, part of the reason why, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we might focus on some things more than others is, is that there are some things that have a bigger impact on more students. And, you know, if we had a limited time, it'd be great to make everything accessible for every possible need. But, but the reality is, you know, we have limited time and we have to prioritize some things over other things. Um, other types of concerns that might come up sometimes are around uh, copyright issues, for example. Mm. People might wonder about that if we're changing content from one format to another. Are we allowed to do that? Um, sometimes it's just... Uh, Sometimes instructors don't know what they're teaching next week, right? They're kind of just getting stuff ready, and so it's hard to, to take the time to make it accessible in advance if you're not even, if your content even isn't even ready in advance. Um, uh -huh. you know, there, there's a lot of different concerns that people can probably relate to um, that might come up at different times. If I could just add, though, is that one thing my experience, and maybe this is just Christopher because he's a good guy, who knows, but is that, that how he just spoke about teachers is, is the, my experience. So he already knows that it's going to be a tough. It's going to be a tough sell potentially. Maybe not again ideologically. Someone's going to be like, "Yeah, I want to do that," but then, but I haven't even. I was going to change my reading for next week. <laughs> so how do I do that? As the, if, if you can't tell already, Christopher, at least in the team that I've been working with with them, they kind of know that it's a possibility, and it's not like there's there's this assumption that you'll just quit everything you do to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially in the context of the book, the book Resilient Pedagogy, I mean, right, we're talking about these switches and kind of pivots that we're making as in, um, because of the pandemic, as we continue on kind of in this pandemic world. And so I was really interested, Christopher, when you mentioned in the seminar that your perspective is that it actually has increased instructors because in increased instructors desire to be mm. to implement accessible design whereas I, I might have thought before you had said that I was thinking maybe this is a really hard time for instructors a lot of us were really in a, a crunch to get things online and, and there's a lot of pressure on instructors right now so I was worried maybe this is something that's easy to fall by the wayside but you you commented that might not be what you perceived yeah I was really surprised by that as well again I think during this time of COVID when there's been so much disruption in our everyday lives and teaching practices uh, that I, I've personally felt overwhelmed at times and I think a lot of us have but and, and, and I don't know exactly what the reason is why we've uh, had kind of an increased demand in accessibility and questions about making our content inclusive. Uh, I might posit that one, one potential idea is that I, I think we're all a little bit more uh, aware. I think we're always um, even in non-COVID or non um, kind of disaster times or whatever, I think all of us are carrying heavy burdens a little bit, right? Everybody struggles with different things. And, and maybe during this time, we're all just a little bit more aware that, that everybody else is also um, maybe struggling, right? I think teachers are, are a little bit more tuned in that, that, yeah, a lot of my students might be struggling right now and having a hard time. I, I think uh, students are also aware and giving teachers maybe a little bit more slack on some of that. And, and perhaps it's just that kind of increased empathy that's come out and, and helped uh, instructors to maybe prioritize a little bit more, just making sure their, their content is inclusive and available to everybody. And if I can just speak from like a rhetorical perspective, sometimes things are more persuasive depending on the context. Mm -hmm. and, by, and so a, an instructor who may have never even taught online is being asked or is asking the experts like Christopher, what should I do? Mm -hmm. And so it's the opportunity to like, here's how you should do it, right? Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Um, and so, so this opportunity to kind of like, hey, just in case, or for future classes, or for, because I know some of my own colleagues don't, before uh, the pandemic, didn't even use like learning management systems that much. They would use them like very minimally. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden being required to use it, a lot of them were asking, what are the best practices? 
And so it's an opportunity to be persuasive and saying, hey, well, this is the best practice. Mm -hmm. I like that. Maybe part of it, we talked earlier about the discomfort of asking for help a little bit, and, and we're all pretty uncomfortable as it is, right? And so maybe it's just one more thing uh, that we can kind of add and, and incorporate into our practices a little bit. Um, and, and then just the other uh, idea that, that we share in the article is that being accessible does just make your content more inclusive. And so teachers, even if they're not maybe super concerned about accessibility, they recognize students are trying to access content on their mobile devices more. So what can I do to make it more accessible in terms of just making it more available to everybody? Sure. There's probably another factor in that. Well, and you kind of alluded to this um, previously, Christopher. So, so is that kind of how you came upon these two techniques or these kind of two? Because in the chapter, right, you give us two ideas on, on which um, that you suggest are kind of easier to implement and might be something that we really do might be our first kind of tasks in making a more accessible online community. So how did you come upon, how did, what are those two, why those two? Good, accessibility when it comes to online content can encompass a whole wide variety and there's a, a long list of types of practices and things that you can do. Some of those practices to make your content accessible are really targeted and will, will benefit more a pretty specific group of users. Um, and, and again, those things are important and we don't want to set those uh, completely to the side, but also we recognize that if you're a teacher with limited time, then, then it's, difficult, it's a difficult ask to have someone go in and maybe do something that's going to potentially benefit a student that I may or may not have in my class this semester. Um, that can be difficult. Again, it's an ideal, it's something we want to shoot for, but, but we find that from trying to persuade people or helping to people to kind of recognize what can I do today to make my content more accessible and inclusive, we tried to identify two practices, um, captioning videos and then converting PDF files to Canvas pages that have as much of an impact on every single student in the classroom as they will on a student with disability. Kind of as a starting place for that conversation and something that almost right out of the gate, every instructor can kind of recognize the value of that for every student in their classroom. And I'll just add that I, I was doing some similar things with captioning before where, where Christopher heard about what, what my classes were doing. Because their genre, uh, video production, and even any kind of text production really that facilitates action could be called technical communication or technical writing, which is what I research and teach. And so I was having students do the captioning and do, producing videos that were more accessible and Christopher introduced this idea of the PDF to Canvas page, which also seemed very like, very much technical communication to me. Um, whether it's the, from the course reading to like a, a syllabus or something like that, that's trying to facilitate action by this in the students. Um, so I was, I wanted to teach my own students uh, to get better at those forms of technical writing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, it just seemed to fit versus if he picked something that was for a, a, a different type of disability that might not be text-based uh, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think with captioning especially, it's one of these things that has become so commonplace and so universal in our everyday experience. There are not many videos, if I open up my phone, whether it's a Netflix or um, Hulu or social media, captions are so ubiquitous. And so I think it's one of these areas where um, and, and, and they're ubiquitous for a number of reasons. Accessibility, yes, but, but also because they are helpful to so many other audiences in so many different contexts and situations. So it's one of those where, um, and our goal is not necessarily to, to call people out when they're not being inclusive, but I think it's one where uh, people are so familiar with that as a practice, and then they say like, I feel like uh, being inclusive is a, is a value of mine, and then you can kind of look at my videos and see, oh, they're not captioned. You can maybe recognize, start asking yourself questions like, oh, I, that's, I'm not actually being um, inclusive in my practice, even though that is a value of mine. Maybe that's something I want to do a little bit differently and recognize that like, it doesn't make sense that I can go um, and all the advertisements on TV are captioned, but not this core important instructional content isn't captioned, right? People can kind of start to recognize, I, I want to do something to fix that. And I recognize that it will benefit a lot of students as I do so. And I'll just add that I, my students recognize this too. I, I, it's not a hard sell for the students who are producing some of these caption videos and the 
PDF to HTML conversions, I don't have to really let go, I promise this is more inclusive, or I promise this is more accessible. They seem to immediately go, I can see I'm doing some good here. Mm -hmm. and, and they seem very motivated to do a good job. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think closed captioning is, is such an interesting example because it's one of these where we've got individuals doing these things, right, where they're putting the captions on it, but it really has become almost a new norm, right, where students, as you mentioned, are really starting to expect that, even though perhaps the university or university, university systems wide, more widely haven't said all information must be captioned. And so that leads me to my next question, which, which is how we can start moving from this kind of reactive, mm -hmm. right? You, this is a, a contrast that you all set up in your chapter a lot, right? Like this, this kind of reactive, waiting for students to come to us so before we make changes, and trying to move into a more proactive space, right? And, the, and one of the nice things about ETE is that there's folks from all, from all different places, right? Like we've got deans, we've got graduate instructors, academic advisors. And so there is amongst all of us some kind of levels of, of power differences, right? And so I'm wondering how we can move this from Sam wants to put captions on her video into, into more of an institutional push, something more systemic that we can say, like this is, this is our institution's proactivity. I wonder, what, like what does that future look like for us? Part of that is resources, um, and I want to hear what Christopher has to say, but we're actually doing research on the, related to this. Um, the more research we actually have that shows that even students uh, uh, without disabilities are, are going to benefit from this, I think the more convincing we're going to be able to make a case uh, for institutions to change practices, um, on some level anyway. So that's, that's one thing that we're actually I have already a small grant. We're going to pursue larger ones to how, what, what would it look like to create, um, to train folks, to what, what to build resources institutionally. Um, so we're starting at the ground up because I agree with you. This is a great question. It's one thing to motivate people ethically, like in terms of inclusivity, on an individual basis or like a classroom or something like that. And it's another thing com completely to have like buy-in from the institution you're part of. What do you think, Christopher? Yeah, I mean, I think the great news is that we've already kind of started down this road. Uh, and there's a, from a couple of different directions. There, there's both top-down type of change that can happen, and there's, and there's bottom-up type of change that can happen. I, I love a quote from a, a, a President Obama that mentioned once, uh, change doesn't come from Washington, change comes to Washington. And we already have an incredible group of instructors who are, who are really already making those extra efforts and in incorporating, uh, whether it be captions or other accessible practices, into their teaching and reaching out for that help and support. Um, and then we've also had some, some great um, initial steps from the university to provide funding for captioning for a lot of our academic videos. That, that isn't mm -hmm. the case in a lot of universities, for example. Um, that said, there's still a long ways to go as far as requiring this or, or mandating it. Um, uh, and I, I don't know exactly what um, each person needs to do, but, but I, I hope each person would start to kind of maybe just ask yourselves, what, what, what can I do? Um, and it could be things like um, just having a conversation in a staff uh, meeting, like to say, hey, I've, I've added, did you know you can add captions to all of your videos? We've done this and my students really like it. Um, another area where not just from teachers, but even, even to help students, um, I, I think, again, as you mentioned, students are accustomed to seeing captions everywhere else, but sometimes when it comes to an academic setting, we, we kind of um, lower our expectations almost, <laughs> right? That, that maybe, uh, you know, it, it, of course my academic videos aren't captioned. My favorite Netflix show is sure, but, but not when I come to learning content. And, and I think helping students to kind of learn, uh, raise their expectations on, on what they can ask for or hope for, um, you know, I mean, I mean, a student could initiate this change in their own uh, classroom to say, hey, teacher, and that happens at times, where a student will be the initiator to kind of bring the conversation up with a, a teacher, and then and it will kind of go from there. Um, and then, then beyond that, I think once kind of enough people start to do this, and I don't know what that critical mass is, mm -hmm. then I think, I think it, the tide really does turn to where it's an anomaly or students start to feel, um, to unlearn, those kind of lowered expectations, I guess, and to really kind of say, hey, teacher, you know, why aren't captions on this video? They are for all of my other courses. Um, mm -hmm. And then at that point, it starts to um, 
become more and more tenable to establish policies um, and, and just practice that would, would make this more common across the institution. And one, one little small thing too is there are little small interventions that can be big. They can actually have large effect. For example, if it's a class that's teaching grad students how to teach, mm -hmm. if we can in, in, intervene on that level, which Christopher has, for example, all, right now with uh, Dr. Beth Boisery and the, the director of composition in the English department, she's bought in and wants Christopher to come in and like give some best practices for these people who are becoming instructors. So that it feels like it is the new normal for them. I know that's a small thing, but it can spread. And the more influence it has, the more places we can intervene where someone's teaching other people how to teach. Mm -hmm. um, online ed uh, spaces, things like that. Uh, oh, ideally, we start seeing this as it's the norm. And when it's not that case, it's when the student's like, hey, oh my gosh, this video is not captioned. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I'm so used to it being captioned. What happened? Like, and they might even ask their professor, hey, I noticed that the video wasn't captioned, or something like that. I think if that, I, I like what you're saying, if that becomes like almost like a norm discuss, a, a discussion that's constant, you know, mm -hmm. that we'll start seeing that at, a, um, at, at least a communal level, if, if not at, a, at the top-down institutional level. Sure, well, and I think that really wraps right around to where we started, which is the title of your chapter, which is a new normal in inclusive, usable online learning experience, right? So moving this so that as you all mentioned, that these are expectations that, that folks, students, instructors, deans, department heads, right? These are just now these expectations that we have. Well, with that, um, we thank you for coming in and sharing your time and your knowledge and your, your values, all, all the information you've given us. Um, and we look forward that I'll drop some links to the book chapter so that folks can um, get in touch with you. And I feel like, Christopher, you're around if, if instructors, as I remember in your chat, saying that you're always emailing folks and don't ever get, um, get emailed so often or get emails back. So, um, so we're so glad that you're, on our, that you're here and that, as I said, it wasn't to, um, to say there's nothing happening here, right? There is a lot. And there is stuff from the institution, like your position, these, this money for captioning, right? There is stuff. There's seeds here happening mm -hmm. that that we hope can start sprouting a little bigger. So please reach out to us. We'd love to help you out. And just, sure. to, just to be clear, I do reply to Christopher's email. <laughs> <laughs> Many instructors do, and we're grateful for that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, and, and we'll catch you on the next podcast. Thanks, Sam. Thanks so much, Sam. Oh, bye. <laughs>